Okay, sorry about the delay, folks. Uh, we are here and we are technology challenged, but we get there in the end. <laughs> so I'd like to welcome you to the next um, session in the Drupal uh, business and strategy track. Do you want to get that door, Andrew? Yeah, thanks. Um, and I'd like to introduce you, Andrew Barnes. Uh, Andrew is um, our, um, the, uh, let's see, where are my notes? Um, he's a managing director of Go One, uh, a Drupal services firm based in uh, Brisbane, yay for Brisbane. Um, he's also on the board of Two Not For Profits. Um, and you're the founder of Go One, aren't you? Co-founder. Co-founder, excellent. Um, Andrew's background is in economics and business management. Uh, and he's currently competing a, uh, uh, completing a PhD at uh, UQ, the University of Queensland, in his spare time, I gather. <laughs> uh, <coughs> Andrew's session is titled Running a Drupal Business. And could you, could you please welcome Andrew Barnes? Uh, are we on? Excellent. So thank you, everyone. And uh, again, it wouldn't be a, a tech conference unless we had technical difficulties. Um, so apologies, we're just running off a PDF at the moment, but hopefully that shouldn't distract from the message. So today's um, sort of talk, I'm, I'm going to run through a couple of topics centred around sort of running uh, and sort of operating within the Drupal ecosystem. It's not just designed for business owners, it's designed for um, anyone who's managing a team, project managers, anyone who's, who's uh, sort of really looking to make, um, make their mark within Drupal in a, a commercial sense. And I wanted to begin with by saying that starting a business I is not the hard part. Uh, it's easy to start a business. You can um, jump online, start one today, start one tomorrow. Uh, but the hard thing is to keep it running. Um, and, and that's a challenge that, that, that I suppose anyone beginning on their first steps in that um, progression are really intending to do. So the focus today is on running a, a business, running a team, all those sorts of related activities and how you can do that in a sustainable way uh, for the long term. How do you make it scale? So again, it's, if you're freelancing in and around Drupal, um, operating in, in a small team, in a big team, there should be some subject matter for you. Um, again, I suppose Mark already did the introductions, but for myself, um, probably a, a good question to begin with is, well, what do I know about Drupal? Uh, I used to do a lot of the development and design in our agency back when we were sort of running with 4.6, 4.7 um, for Drupal Core. Since then, we've sort of grown to sort of 30 to 40 Drupalers across sort of three cities. A and on top of that, I suppose, I've got a bit of a background in the theory of business as well, um, however right or wrong that may be. Um, so I, I haven't escaped uh, academia in that regard either. Um, and I suppose my my approach, my personal philosophy with um, business and life in general is, is you want to achieve something which creates sustainable growth. You don't want to do this just for the short term. You don't want to do it for, for today or tomorrow. You want to do it for something that, that has a, a good sort of progression over the longer term. And from a personal perspective, hopefully that makes us all very happy. Um, and that's, uh, I suppose, the two sort of context there. Uh, contact details are at the bottom, and, and by all means, if, if you've got any questions either during or after the presentation, just um, uh, let me know. So if we dive into this presentation, we might begin with, well, what, what is a business? What do we mean by, by, by this sort of um, catch-all term? Uh, then I wanted to cover an another sort of three pillars uh, in terms of some processes, systems, and structures that sometimes are um, intuitive, sometimes are obvious and sometimes are not that obvious. A and again, this isn't gospel. This is just um, elements that we found work, elements that we found didn't work, and, and are worth sharing and sort of talking about today. But um, I'll touch on those sorts of three areas. In addition to that, business, the world, it's, it's all about people. So understanding those relationships, internal, external, and, and particularly with Drupal as a community project, um, how that all sort of interrelates. And the final one being um, hopefully the fun stuff is what's the end, um, end point with it all? What are we trying to achieve and how do we go about that? So if we, we start off with what is a business, uh, we might first look to our wonderful friends at the ATO, which is the Australian Taxation Office. Um, they've got a lot to say about what a business is. And if you look at their definition, uh, a business is basically anything, uh, which is 
really um, helpful and self-serving in their regard because then uh, pretty much anything you do, you need to pay tax. But um, you could also take a look at what Wikipedia says, and that would be a business is anything where you're doing something commercially viable, which I think is important, um, and something which is creating profit. It doesn't need to be in a monetary sense, but often enough, uh, that's what we associate business with. But what does a Drupal business look like? Um, and, and I tried to put together a three sort of catch-all terms which I thought um, captured a lot of, of what a Drupal business um, can look like and they may not be fully exhaustive, there, there may be other different models. But the first one that we're probably all very familiar with is, is a traditional services firm. So, and I've used, uh, I've just um, italicized traditional here because you're now sort of looking at software as a service and everything's becoming a service within the tech industry. But if you look at traditional services as those sort of time uh, or project build, um, operations, then your Drupal shops, similar to what we operate um, at Go One, similar to what um, Phase Two operates, what um, WonderCrowd operates as, that, that's really the traditional services um, model. A and more recently with Drupal, we're starting to see a second um, model emerge, which is a product-based Drupal business. And I'm trying to describe with that term anything which might be sort of a a managed service or a software as a service, platform as a service. You could look at um, startups like Pantheon or um, more um, sort of recognizable name perhaps as Acquia with their um, cloud hosting offering uh, and Drupal Gardens. A and that comes under that, that second banner. But another element which might come under that second banner with the, the Drupal business sort of um, world is, is payment gateways. Payment gateways are, are not necessarily part of Drupal but at the same time, they're, they're part of that ecosystem <laughs> and they're um, monetized in a totally different way. And, and other services like Mollum, while that may not be built into your website as an anti-spam tool, you may subscribe to that as a service. Um, and, and themes and modules, and, and this has always been sort of a touchy topic within the community in terms of, okay, well, what's okay under the GPL? What's, what is the Drupal way in terms of giving back and community contribution? So it's always been sort of a more of a dangerous area, but probably sits within that category. Uh, and the final one is is a hybrid model, where you might be releasing GPL products uh, such as open source distributions, uh, and then have related activities based off that. So I'm, I'm not sure. Does anyone know about sort of Commerce Kickstart and Commerce Platform that the Commerce guys are sort of put out? Yeah. So that would be an example of a hybrid model where you've got a traditional services firm uh, offering a, a distribution and uh, offering that out to the community. And uh, I think one observation that I wanted to make around this point is increasingly we're seeing traditional services firm branch into that third, third topic. And that's something as well that, um, that we're looking into doing as, uh, as we speak. But what else makes a business? Is if they're the three types of Drupal businesses out there, um, then let's dive into the details, some of the, the nuts and bolts in that. And the first thing that I want to start off with is, is probably the most obvious, but something which I feel is, is the most important as well. And that's um, that a business is made up of people. Uh, people are our clients, they're our staff, they're our friends, they're, they're the family that, uh, that forgives us for um, working late nights and traveling far too much. Um, and you achieve so much more when everyone is aligned. You want diversity, you want different opinions, but you want everyone to be heading in the same direction. A and as a bit of context around that, what we do within our organization is try and achieve that by making sure that we've got small teams that operate on different projects and operate together over a sustained period of time, and they need the, the capacity and capability to do what they, they're required to do. But at the same time, um, you want them to be small enough to be flexible so that, that way the goals and objectives of those teams can be very personal and, and very much aligned with the individuals within it. Um, and when there is a group of people uh, and then the group of people grows and you have to put a slide together like this, you start to panic when you realize you missed out 20 or 30 people within a slide. But um, here's some of the faces that make up our operations. So what are some more people strategies? If one of the strategies we're implementing is to have a small group, uh, lots of small groups rather, what's some of the other things that 
that we found have worked particularly well. Uh, number one is, is making the work environment collaborative. You want everything to be as inclusive as possible. And you want the right culture to permeate the organisation. Um, and part of that is making decisions inclusive, making sure that people are um, sort of engaged and, and proactive and energised around it. You do really need to listen to everyone. Um, and at this stage, I should apologise because when I was looking through different slides which should sort of fit um, this presentation, I kind of turned the rest of the presentation into a um, uh, sort of a, a tribute to Dilbert. <laughs> But, but it really is important that you don't do it in a token effort when you're trying to make decisions inclusive um, and you need to sort of act, act across all levels of the organisation when you're doing that. Otherwise, it's just a, a cheap trick that um, isn't genuine. Uh, so in context for us, we've got um, a whole bunch of different teams within our organisation across the sort of services and product related areas. Um, we collaborate daily over Skype. Uh, is one of our main tools. It, I know it sounds simple, but having group chats open where everyone just sort of posts their, their feedback into it is an amazingly um, powerful tool. Uh, we, we try and be professional, but be fun um, internally and externally with, with how we interact. And we want to encourage excellence and we expect growth amongst everyone within the organisation. Um, and coming back to that sort of listening point. So going from people to something which is a little bit more abstracted is what else makes a business? And I think processes um, provide a mechanism for your people to act. Uh, they're particularly obviously um, useful in the case of new staff, but it's also really important that you have a, a consistency of behaviour across your organisation so that um, the interactions are, um, are fairly sustained and predictable. Uh, and it's really important, important that processes aren't, again, just implemented for the sake of it, that they're not abstractions of reality, uh, and instead that you take the time to actually boil down what you're trying to achieve or, or what you're currently doing on a daily basis, and you isolate the, the salient points or the, the critical points within that. And, and some of those critical points, um, or, or what should a process contain, I is covered within these next two slides. So if, if you think about it, um, a process should be effective in terms of if you're describing uh, a process that you respond to support inquiries, that process should be achieving what your overall goal is around that. That is, uh, It should be efficient. Uh, you don't want to add so many steps into it that it becomes an, a nightmare to fulfil because it, it's not the best use of time for the people undertaking it. Uh, and a process should also be relevant so that way it doesn't have um, it's not superfluous, you're not creating a process for taking the garbage out when everyone knows how to take the garbage out. You're not creating a process for things which, which are unnecessary. Uh, and it needs to be usable. So it needs to be something which is accessible um, and understandable for the organisation and for your staff. Uh, it needs to be something that is introduced through induction, it needs to be something that's reinforced over time. Uh, and equally then, if it's usable, you need people to use it. Uh, it's too often within our organisation, um, we'll create processes, then we'll go back six months later, we'll have another strategic planning session, we'll create more processes, then we'll compare the two processes and they're identical, we just never use the first one in the first place. Um, which is important and introduces why they need to be reused, they need to be managed and monitored, and they need to be measured. And, and measurement's a really critical concept that I found in sort of business, is if you're not measuring it, um, those parameters, those elements that, that you're trying to achieve just won't be achieved. So what else makes a business then? Um, I was saying I was going to go through processes and systems and th they may overlap a lot, but I, I think particularly for this audience, um, systems we might take today to mean a, a tool or a technical element that helps you achieve um, those processes. And there are obvious systems, if you've got a project management system, if you've got a version control system in your organisation. Um, but things such as your office phones, uh, like I said, we use Skype a lot internally to, um, to keep abreast of, of what everyone within the organisation is doing, or if you use Google Chat, they're all great systems. Uh, I'd even go as far as to saying, look, um, coffee machines, having beer in the fridge, um, which 
um, for a caffeine addicted organization like us uh, is a critical element to success, uh, are really important support mechanisms and systems that, um, that help you achieve your business objectives. And as a technical person, I also think, I, al I used to think that systems were the cure-all, that they were fantastic. And I would jump into a new system, set it up overnight, and think, excellent, all, all of our problems are now solved. Uh, we've got this new um, task management system, we've got this new finance system, fantastic. I read the feature list, our, our business is going to double next year, double next month. Um, but that, that's not the whole answer. Um, systems aren't the cure-all. Uh, they're important to help sort of make those um, processes uh, usable and efficient. But if you don't follow them, if you don't use the system or if you don't use it in the right way, uh, don't expect to get the outcomes that, that you were looking for. Um, they rely on underlying good processes and the adherence to them, uh, which is why those reporting and monitoring metrics uh, are so critical um, in those sorts of um, contexts. And if we um, look at our good friend Ben Franklin here, uh, the next step is, is around structure. And once you've got processes and systems in place, how do you start achieving uh, your business objectives, whether they be a client project, whether they be an internal project, or, or whether they be something else entirely? Uh, it's, really, it's really important to have a structure. Um, and one of our project managers likes to say, um, that he's very happy when he knows that he's not on time because at least he knows where he is. Um, I think that's, again, a little bit too self-serving, but um, you have to agree. At the end of the day, it's better to have a plan and know where you are relative to that than, than not to have one at all. And as part of that, that planning component, we had a, a great talk this morning um, by uh, the CEO of a, a Drupal shop out of Europe on agile planning, is, is identifying those tasks breaking them out into small tasks, prioritizing those tasks, and allocating resources around them to help achieve those tasks. Uh, but one part of planning that we often forget is what, what if it all stuffs up? What if we run these plans, we follow these plans, and it doesn't work out? Um, you have to consider contingencies. If you're planning on delivering a, a large project, uh, and then suddenly you win two large projects, what are you going to do in those situations? What's going to happen if um, one of the developers or designers that you're depending on is sick or unavailable or, or otherwise busy? Um, try and foresee some problems that might arise. And make sure that your planning is as robust as possible to those events. Um, and, and then, uh, unfortunately, paradoxically almost, try not to overplan. Uh, you can spend twice as long uh, planning than the project itself and there's obviously diminishing returns to, to how long you're spending on that. But I'd probably guess that everyone, myself included in this room, doesn't spend enough time planning. Um, and if you get into the, the category of over planning, then um, that's probably just sort of self-correcting a little bit. Um, now, if we go back to, to uh, I suppose, what I was saying is one of the underlying most important elements to a business in terms of the, the people within it, what really makes people tick is relationships. Um, this is a topic that I, I've considered both within our professional environment, but also from a research perspective, is in terms of how do you make um, better collaborations, better relationships. Um, and, and a big part of this is the company culture. Um, your identity, your brand, both external and internal. Um, marketeers have sort of latched onto that. And now everything to do with the business I is now marketing. It's, it's all how you present yourself. But th that may not be necessarily incorrect as well. I, I think if you consider your culture as a, a core part of your business, and it's something that you can't um, necessarily consciously always set out to achieve, then, then that's an important mindset to take. <coughs> um, so your relationships, both internal and external, uh, with clients, with staff, are a key sort of part of this. Uh, and one of the major important um, points that, that I was saying that I wanted to emphasize at the beginning with, with our culture is we try and make sure that it, it's fun, um, but at the same time that we're, we're professional in terms of doing it. And it, it doesn't matter how far along that, that sort of spectrum that you are, but as long as you um, sort of are, are conscious in, in setting out where you want the business to be and that, that culture to be, and as long as that aligns with 
all the people within the company and what they're trying to achieve um, in, in their workplace, then I think you're onto a winner. And, um, and engendering a, a sense of collaboration is an important sort of focus um, as part of that. I, I thought I'd pause for a moment and just put up a, um, what probably looks like a, a series of little dots and larger dots. But um, anyone have, want to have any guesses what this image is um, showing? No guesses? Um, it is a picture of every single academic who has ever published a paper in the last 10 years at the University of Queensland. Um, surprisingly, academics at UQ look a lot like circles. But uh, on, on top of that, what you should see is that there's a couple of big points uh, within this diagram. But the most important thing is how connected um, people are. And it's those connections which have, have been proven in, in research papers time and time again that create the outcomes. So connections, not just in terms of the number of connections. Um, I, I always tend to look at people on LinkedIn who have those 500 plus connections as um, trying a little bit too hard just to network for the sake of networking. Uh, but also the quality of those connections in terms of are you connected with people that, um, that will help you achieve the objectives that, that you're trying to do within your personal life and your business life. And that can be as obvious and, and, and having diversity in those connections. Uh, the one thing that you notice in your own personal connections is they're probably very similar. You're probably um, very well associated with people in the same town as yourself, speak the same language as yourself, um, have the same personal interests. But that doesn't allow you to think very differently to them. It doesn't allow you to have conversations where you can come up with new ideas or bounce around different, different concepts. And one of the really interesting things that's coming out of research more recently is that for success, both you need to have larger teams and you need to have more diverse teams. Um, and, and there's obviously difficulties involved with diversity, but it's worth sort of consciously thinking through that as well. Um, on that subject of sort of having access to different sort of perceptions and, and different um, sort of mindsets, I, I wanted to sort of come back to the fact that I think within our industry, within the tech industry and within IT, I think knowledge is our competitive advantage. Uh, particularly for a services company, the more that you know, the better you can uh, implement different solutions. That, that is your competitive advantage. Uh, and so around that, collaboration within your business and external to it is how you're going to grow that and how you're going to be able to leverage that. Um, and by being open in your discussions with others, you'll actually achieve more. It's not a scarcity mentality that, that we have within an open source community, which is fantastic. Uh, but at the same time, I think there, there's a lot of instances similar to the slide here that I've been in um, going, well, look, why, why do I want to be open? It, it sometimes isn't intuitive but it, it really is um, an asset I would um, encourage you all to sort of consciously set out to do. <coughs> and so if we go, look, if, if we're doing business, and, and I'll start swing back towards Drupal now again, if we're doing business in, in the Drupal ecosystem, what is Drupal in light of all, all of these um, topics? Uh, well, Drupal is a community collaboration. Uh, it's a mentality of looking for the long term, that we're not just looking for for something which is going to, to solve our problem today or tomorrow in terms of you could hack core, you could um, do some nasty sort of CSS hacks to, to achieve what you want on your website or on your client's website. But fortunately enough, this community doesn't um, advocate that and rather takes a much longer term view going, well, how are you going to support that? How are you going to make sure your life is easier into the future? Um, and, and when you develop something for a client, releasing it back to the community is part of that. Is it going to be worth your while spending those extra hours releasing a module, even though that may not necessarily be paid for? Um, and that's something that we come across quite recently. And, and our answer to that is, is at least if we think we're going to come up with a, another requirement similar to that in the future, then, then yes, it is worth that time. And it doesn't necessarily need to just be in a, a development light as well. Um, so you can see that if you imagine that network of circles that we were showing before in a, a, an academic research context, uh, I would advocate that similarly we've got a, a network of circles that, that we're not necessarily always aware of within this Drupal community uh, and out into the wider community as well. We don't want to necessarily be inward focused. 
either within our business or within the project. But, um, but those connections are, are how we sort of share the knowledge and how we sort of move things forward. Um, so rather than sort of touching too much on um, sort of meetups versus contributions and, and close and proprietary, um, I just wanted to advocate that doing business doesn't necessarily need to be against the Drupal way, uh, the open source way. I think the two are, are very complementary. Um, and now on to some of the um, more sort of, uh, I suppose, not fun stuff, but uh, the business outcomes and the pointy end of what we're, we're trying to achieve with a, a commercial activity based in and around the Drupal ecosystem. Um, I'd suggest that one of the most important things that a business can have is a sustainable profit. Um, not, not a lot of money today, not a lot of t money tomorrow, but at the same time, not running massive losses. You're, you're not going to be around in the future unless you can come up with a business model which allows you to create a sustainable profit. Uh, and the million dollar question around that is, well, how do you do that? How do you create sustainable profit? How do you grow sustainable profit? Um, and, and I think there's three points, three principles around that that I'll go through and then we'll sort of swing back to those Drupal business models that we were looking at before to work out how you can create sustainable profits in each of those business models. Um, I, I think the first principle to keep always in mind is, is to be fair to your clients, uh, whether they be product users, whether they be uh, service users, but be transparent. Uh, Drupal is amazing, help educate them about it, help grow their knowledge, um, help educate them. Uh, but also understand your client. And I think one thing, um, myself included, that, that we as um, developers or um, website builders often forget is your client has different priorities to you. Um, their website may not be the most important thing to their business. Uh, in fact, it's often not. Um, and how you then go about doing that uh, needs to be uh, relative and, and appropriate to that. And uh, I think it was summed up nicely this morning by saying, if you expose the, the, the cost or the resources or the time it's going to take to do certain um, tasks or certain projects, then your client can work out if the business outcome supports it. <coughs> but the flip side of that is sometimes the website or, or the project that you're working on with your client is the most important thing to their business. It's core, it, it's central to their business succeeding. And if that's the case, it's really important to, um, to treat it that way. It's really important then to take on a level of ownership um, as, as the expert in the field to make sure that what's being implemented is again, not for the short term, but for the longer term and educating through that. Um, and I'd probably sum up the, um, the bottom cartoon strip as try not to, to achieve or convince through obscurity. Try not to be too abstract, but if you can explain and put it in, in an understandable um, context for your client or for your end user, then you'll really sort of hit the point um, much closer. Um, and the other two principles are sort of stem from that. Be fair to your staff uh, and be fair to yourself. I think um, certainly one of our, our learnings internally was that we always wanted to, to create a happy outcome, even if that was at our own expense. And sometimes in life, you, you can't always do that. And whilst it's important for you to compromise and, and make sure that you're trying to achieve the best for your client, uh, don't expect the impossible um, from your team and, and don't, um, I, I suppose, put up with clients that expect the, the impossible from you. There is the 80-20 rule in terms of um, the businesses that you engage with and which ones will be the most um, conducive to, to sort of long-term success versus the ones which will be a drain on, on your resources and, and a drain on your staff. A and in terms of being fair to your staff, um, do expect honesty and diligence, but provide the same in return. Reward the small staff, create a, a culture that really sort of um, celebrates those small successes. Uh, and an important note is if you're running a team, if you're running a project, if you're um, running a business, uh, be fair to yourself. It's not going to be sustainable to work 100 hour weeks, uh, to not sleep. It's not going to be sustainable to yourself to not pay yourself. If you're in a business where you're, you're earning much less than you could um, elsewhere, uh, understand that uh, and don't necessarily need to change it today or tomorrow, but make sure that that's part of 
the plan for the future. Um, don't sort of skirt around uncomfortable truths like that. Uh, and one point which probably included, um, again, from personal experience, I is you're not responsible for other people's circumstances. Um, yes, it's useful and, and yes, it's good to be empathetic and supportive, uh, but don't um, sacrifice yourself just for the sake of the, um, the circumstances that others are up against, particularly when you're engaging with businesses where, where they're trying to get you to solve their, um, their business problems. E educate and explain, but ultimately uh, they need to help in the process as well. Um, and, and change happens. It's not necessarily a, a principle a, as in so much a truth. Um, and I, th I wanted to share a couple of hypotheses and ideas that relate to the Drupal ecosystem and business around it uh, in terms of changes that um, I, I think are um, other people have, have sort of noted them and, uh, and I think are obvious as well. Uh, and the first one is I, I think there is a growing commoditization of websites. Um, websites ten years ago, five years ago, um, were a very specialised domain, uh, but now it's much more of a product. Um, you can jump onto Squarespace, uh, someone can, can purchase a website off eBay for $50 now. Uh, so there's strong downward pressures on, on services around that. Um, and is that a good or a bad thing? Uh, I don't know, but I don't think it's, um, it's either. And what is the justification from our end to a client for using Drupal over a, an off-the-shelf solution like Squarespace. Sure, one might be more pure and from a um, sort of developmental stand standpoint is, is a nicer uh, option, but what is their objectives and, and how are we trying to sort of fit in with that? A and I think the response needs to be to compete with that. So if, you, if you're going up um, against competitors like that, Make sure your processes are efficient. Make sure they're as lean as possible. Uh, use a platform like Agia to release different um, versions of sites very quickly or different platforms very quickly. And use distributions like Commerce Kickstart, which is, um, if again, people haven't come across, is a fantastic tool to get you 80 or 90% of the way there for a, a small e-commerce shop. Use them to get a running start. And, and I think the most important point around this is if websites or web designers increasingly becoming commoditized, differentiate yourself in terms of providing business solutions. Uh, Drupal is a fantastic tool for embedding business logic into it, embedding workflows into it, or, or at least it's now becoming a fantastic platform for that as opposed to, to where it was years ago. But um, use that to your advantage and embed some business logic into the site because that increases the, um, the value that you're delivering. Um, additionally, um, separate to the commoditization of websites is we're in a market which is, is now maturing. Um, we're not just small players anymore. There's not just Drupal shops of, uh, of individuals or five people or, or even ten people. Again, the, the speech this morning uh, I think was a couple of hundred staff. Arquio has 300 staff a and you've got organizations like Accenture and Capgemini who have tens of thousands of staff. How do you compete when a, a business or a firm like that can throw 10,000 developers at a project uh, when you might have two? Um, and they're a better risk profile for um, government and corporate agencies, um, or at least there is less perceived risk within those organisations, whether or not um, the end outcomes are, are quite as conducive. So I think the response needs to be um, to focus on your difference. Uh, to sort of celebrate that and exploit that. Uh, for a big team or um, if you want one, Drupal in Australia might not fit that. You might not be the development seeds of the world in terms of being a Drupal mapping specialist, um, but still have a difference, own that difference. Uh, the next point in terms of once we've got some profit, we now want some growth. How do we then grow the business itself? And uh, I'm just going to go back to the types of business because I think it really depends on, on what your business model is in terms of how you grow it. I, if you're operating as a Drupal dev shop and you've got staff and you're billing clients, it's always going to be a function of hours or, or how much you can churn out. Um, and that's fine, you just need to grow your numbers. It's very um, difficult and challenging though at times. Um, product and software as a service, uh, fortunately 
is very easy to scale. Uh, the flip side to that though is it's very, very difficult to, to build version one or, or to get the first one out the door. Um, and, and if you're going after a hybrid model, uh, again, it may be a defensible position, but distributions or, or equivalents are again very resource intensive to do up front. So none of these options are, are the, the silver bullet. None of them is the one approach I'd advocate everyone sort of step out of the room and, and start running after. But I think it is important to consider it and go, look, for our business model, for your business model, where, where do you want to position yourselves? Um, and, and I thought I'd end to contextualize a little bit with some examples from our end, with um, one being a, a platform that we call Ajuro, which is an e-learning platform built around Drupal. Uh, because for us, Drupal is our bread and butter. It's what we, we focus on um, day and night, and, and we lo uh, love the platform. But um, e-learning and education is a market where we see tremendous results being delivered by Drupal, and we wanted to, to again sort of have a running start there. And the, um, the second one is a, a, a distribution that we're releasing over this week, which is called GoCampaign. It's a, a CRM or social media platform, which you can install and, and download and run, run yourselves. But uh, again, it, it's designed to, to allow us to have a distribution which we can support and, and sort of grow into the future. A and those are really the sort of um, elements which I think define, well, what is Drupal in a, in a business context? What is um, the sort of models that are out there? And what are some of the approaches to make sure that they're, um, the structure that your organization is taking is as effective as possible? Um, and I think, one minute early, but um, I just wanted to sort of open up for the next um, five or ten minutes if there was any questions that people had or um, any sort of um, thoughts on, on the sort of points I just went through. Yep, that's right. Yep. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a good question. So um, just to repeat for everyone, how do we balance our clients, client deliverables versus our own internal projects or products? And it's um, been one we struggled with for a long time because you'll say, look, we're, we're really excited about building um, this product. And then a client comes through the door and says, look, I'll, I'll pay you $50,000 if you do this website for me. And you go, well, this, this, this product would be lovely, but um, I would quite like this now. Um, and that's why the, the short term versus long term is really important to consider. Uh, we solved that problem only in the last six to 12 months and we've got dedicated teams. So each of those um, units that I flashed up on the screen has their own teams, has their own budgets, has their own um, objectives. They each have a manager responsible for that. Um, so if a project does come through the door and says, look, I want to do this, um, then our services teams will, will go after that. And if they need to grow larger to accommodate that, they will but they can't steal resources um, from, from the other objectives in, unless, unless it's some really sort of monumentally <laughs> justifiable um, project. Yep. Yeah, so in terms of productivity, I think it comes down to measurement, uh, but how do you measure an abstract concept like productivity? Um, you can have, uh, and we do in our organization, have different types of people. A, a developer who is um, very knowledgeable on Drupal as a platform, um, very experienced in that regard, and very, very slow. Um, or you could have someone who's um, very good at just getting things done, but may not do it in technically the best way. I think productivity comes down to um, a question of, well, what was your expectations um, and how good were you at those expectations? So if you're going into a project and you're saying, look, we think it'll be 40 hours of design for this project, um, did you achieve a good result uh, within that estimate or were you not productive enough and ended up using 120 hours um, or were you not productive enough and didn't achieve a good result in, in less than that? Um, it's not a, a perfect answer, but that's our, our approach anyway in terms of trying to um, encourage that and, and measure it as well. And I think some of the mechanisms um, 
in terms of collaboration, in terms of um, that culture help boost it, but you have to measure it too. Yep. It's yeah. Uh, yeah, no, it's um, a good question, particularly for us because we, we operate um, fairly lean on the ground in terms of we're, we're across three. Um, and, and next week I'll be off to Bangkok to open up an office there, um, which will have all of two people in it. Um, it it's those tools and systems to support that. Um, so uh, a, uh, a presentation just before from um, one of the developers within Suncorp, they've got four offices, 30 people, similar sort of size, and they've just got video screens where you can walk up to and it's already got a video screen into to their office in, in China or in, in Melbourne or in Brisbane. Um, we try and do similar things within our organisation, but e even basic things like Skype are, um, are, are great. And we do staff exchanges in terms of we, we try and get people moving between the offices a lot, um, holding sort of events where people can, can get together. Um, so those sorts of things. Yeah. That's it. Yeah, so as Daniel, who um, sort of actually does all the work, uh, and I just sort of sit here and, and spend my life doing talks, um, was saying we. Our corporate structure is not geographically based. Um, so those teams that, that I said, they're, they're not focused in one spot or another, they're, they're spread across. So you'll have a project manager in one location who may have um, a designer working with them in, in their same office, they may have a developer working in another office, and they'll run through a QA process in another office. They'll all be on Skype all at the same time talking together. The, the challenge will become in the future, how do you run um, distributed teams and create a culture when you're operating in totally different time zones. Th that'll be a challenge. Uh, at the moment, we're, we're lucky that we're only sort of three hours difference uh, across all the um, sort of bases. Any other questions? All good. Uh, well, thank you very much. I'll um, sort of stick around if there's any other sort of um, queries afterwards, but um, thank you very much. Hello. Th thanks so much, Andrew. Um, now, uh, you might have noticed on the website uh, the evaluation feature has been switched on. Uh, so go to the session schedule page. Uh, and if you could evaluate the sessions that you've been to today, that would be wonderful, please. You can also put uh, comments on the uh, individual session pages as well. Uh, that'll be the, the feedback will be collated uh, by the D Drupal Association. Uh, and uh, the speakers love to be able to hear feedback as well so they can um, you know, continually improve their talks and everything. Uh, so I believe that is us for today. Um, what's next on the program? I didn't look before I came up here. Sorry. Drinks? Beach cricket, yeah. Okay, across the road. So thanks very much for your attendance. And could you please thank Andrew Barnes once more?